morning, Lee Valley Church. It's great to be with you again. And you know what? Uh, we should let's let's enjoy this while we got it. You know, I mean, we have um, said we miss meeting, and that's true. But at the same time, you know, when can you go to church in your pajamas and dressing gown? Never. So let's make the most of this, and uh, let's see blessing and everything. And it's really, really, really important. Please engage, especially in the worship, especially as we hear the word uh, and when we. Uh, give our worship to God and when we worship God it's really important that we do it with all of our hearts on mind and strength you know he's worthy the Bible says in Hebrews 13 verse 15 through Jesus therefore let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruits of lips that openly profess his name we can do that together right now we can give God our sacrifice of praise and uh, wherever you are I will encourage you stand up sing the songs worship God connect with Jesus let's do it together in your homes and um, will you join me right now let's stand father we thank you that we can be called your church a part of the church of Jesus Christ and we know oh God that you are working and moving in our days in our nation we thank you that we get to be a part of that that we get to call ourselves redeemed and saved because of Jesus because of your blood because of your sacrifice so we offer you our sacrifice of praise we worship you we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus let's worship God and let's sing together thank you
you for giving your life so that we could have life. You made us eternal. And thank you that through your death on the cross and shedding your blood, you gave us a chance for our sins to be washed away. So shame did not have to rule us in our hands. Thank you that there is access to reconciliation.
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, and all.
worthy of all of our praise. And your people say, great are you, Lord. We exalt you, Lord. Yeah, hallelujah. Thank you, God. You are so great. You are so good, oh God. You are all we need. We need not fear anything. We need not question or worry. And I have the... Uh, the Lord gave me a word today. It's from Genesis 15. I don't know who needs to hear this, but it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. Abraham had just rescued his uh, nephew Lot. And uh, there was many kings. And uh, he won a great victory and brought back Lot. And some kings, uh, they offered him... Those he rescued offered him a share of the booty, of the reward of the plunder. And he said, no, nah, I don't want to take anything of yours. God is his reward. I love how God appears to Abram after and says, do not fear. All throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, oftentimes God appears and says, do not fear. And I want to encourage you today, do not fear, but put your trust in God. Do not fear equals faith. God says, the ground, the, the basis, the foundation of not fearing is the fact that God is our shield. He will fight for us. And we don't need to worry about taking booty or plunder from what people can give us. He is our great reward. He is enough for us. So I, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know who needs to hear this. I just want to encourage you. Do not fear. Trust God. He is your reward. Don't look to man to reward you. Don't fear what's in the bank account or whatever. Just trust God. Put your faith in God. Fear, anxiety, these things don't drive us. They don't drive our decisions. They don't drive our day-to-day -day life. What drives our day-to-day -day life is faith that God will protect us. He's our shield and that God is our reward. No matter what happens, no matter what we have, we have the assurance of eternal life. We have the assurance of the riches of heaven, the blessings of a prosperous soul in Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, that you are great, that we do not fear anything this world can throw at us or the devil can throw at us because you are our shield, you are our great reward, and we thank you, O oh God. We can trust you. We can put our faith in you. We can uh, put our, our hope in you, knowing that, that uh, we are never, ever, ever going to fear death or hell or, or we don't need to fear anything oh god or loss we don't need to fear anything because you are our shield our very great reward we thank you oh god we praise you we worship you and i lift up this nation oh god help us not to be fearful we are living in the last days things happen things are shaking we're living in quite some unusual times a fearful time sometimes but i just pray oh god that fear won't drive us faith will drive us i pray in jesus name for this nation for the uk Oh God, I thank you. You've not finished yet until the trumpet sounds. You've not finished with this nation. I pray, oh God, let your church grow. Let your church and your kingdom advance. Let souls be saved and gathered. And let, let the church increase in these last days, I pray. Let the souls be saved more than ever before even. Revive us, O oh God, and bless the government and those in power. I lift up the nation of Israel to you as well, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, that your promises concerning your people in the last days, O oh God, that, that you are drawing them to yourself, O oh God, that the Bible says in Romans 9 to 11, one day all Israel will be saved. And we pray, O oh God, for your people. Protect them, surround them like a shield, uh, and protect them from any enemies that might want to harm them, O oh God. And as well, O oh God, we remember the persecuted church, those who are suffering for being Christians, and again, we're living in days where this is increasing more and more. People are literally dying for their testimony of Jesus. I pray you'll surround them, comfort them, encourage them. And in places where there is persecution, I pray the church will keep exploding and keep growing. And you'll keep, uh, 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 your kingdom will keep advancing in the mighty name of Jesus. And we say together the Lord's Prayer. Every Sunday we do this. Our Father, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive Give us our, our sins. sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the, the power, and, and the glory, glory. forever Amen. and ever. Amen. 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 And you know, this leads me nicely into, uh, we're going to take our tithes and offerings now. 
and the details will come at the end of the meeting, the bank details, and you can find the bank details online as well. But uh, I just want to encourage you. We give in faith, and uh, as, as Christians, as the church, if you belong to us as a church, we believe in tithing and offering. You've heard us teach on this. But I want to encourage you. We don't, we don't uh, withhold in fear, but we give in faith. We trust God in faith. He loves a cheerful giver. Someone who's cheerful and generous in their disposition means that they can be cheerful and generous. Why? Normally, it's because it's rooted in faith that no matter what, God is in control. That no matter what, we don't need to fear what happens with our finance, with our resource. We trust God that at the end of the day, we cannot outgive God. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in us. He's easy, way easy, able to bless us in this life or in the next. It doesn't matter. But we just trust God. So uh, in faith that God is our shield and our reward, let's give with generous hearts and believe that we are sowing into his kingdom as the gospel is being preached and uh, even more people are being reached in these days. That's quite exciting because of the online world. And uh, we are giving uh, as part of the church, part of our offerings, part of our worship. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Uh, we're, I'm excited now to introduce our speaker, which is Pastor Bo. But don't forget as well, we're going to take communion at the end. But uh, look, right now, let's have hearts that are open Ears that are unstopped, ears that are open as well to hear what God wants to say, and let's have willing hearts to change as well. Thank you, Pastor Bo. Good morning, Lee Valley Church. Good morning, those who have tuned in to um, have church with us this morning, church online. It's my privilege to stand in the pulpit, and I've been preceded by some incredible speakers, Tim and um, Jeff, who have probably, I'm not going to bring you anything new on the church, it's our fifth week on the church this morning, but I guess I'm going to bring to you stuff that's living in, in my life right now. So I started thinking, when I was thinking about preparing this, I started thinking about the entire, the paradoxes in the kingdom of God. You know, if you want to be big, be little. If you want to, um, if you hold on, it tends to loss. If you give, it tends to getting. Um, and I just began to think about the paradoxes in the church. So I'm going to share a couple of those with you this morning that I think have relevance in our situation. One of the paradoxes of the Church of Jesus Christ is that it looks up, I believe, in order to look out. In my opinion, to say that the church is primarily mission-based mission is still oh, going to put, put my teeth in this morning, is to miss a trick. Mission will get us busy, but mission as the chief aim falls short. And it's not that I'm mission-averse, church, but it's just that I want us to be motive-aware as we go into our mission. To my way of thinking, before we can be effective in our great commission, as, as released upon us by Jesus himself, we must first be grounded in the great commandment. It is possible to go about the great commission with the ardency and myopic focus of a devotee, yet never convey the heart that has commissioned us. And I guess that's what my first point is this morning. Jesus is nothing if he is not love. For Jesus is God, and God does not just have love, but as the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 4, God is love. And it is true that Jesus' last instruction in Matthew 28, that's from verse 18, is a clear signpost of the what we are called to. But I want us to back up a little bit, because I believe it's the power of the what flows from the presence of the who as offered to us in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which repeat that great commission. Can I say that again? Jesus is clear about what we're to do, but I think the power of what we're to do will flow from the abiding presence of the who is with us as we go about that commission. And, you know, the, the great commission, we get that setting from a time when Jesus was going about his business, and a, <coughs> excuse me, a certain lawyer, I'm sorry, <coughs> who was also a Pharisee, came to Jesus with the intention of tricking him with a question. 
And the man asked Jesus to identify the greatest commandment of the law. In other words, he wanted Jesus to nail down and definitively state the most important law. The one thing, the most important law, the greatest commandment that could supersede potentially all the other laws. And when I tell you that there was a list of 613 mitzvot, I I, I actually printed them off to have a look at them, of the laws, the religious laws that bound the um, pharisaical devotee. If you wanted to be an observer of the law, you've got 613 commandments here which cover everything from God, the Torah, signs and symbols, all the way through to leprosy, Nazarites, and wars. I mean, it's extensive. So I, I understand, I mean, that's a lot of laws to live by, right? So I understand the economy behind the question. But we know that that Pharisee, because the Bible tells us that he came with the intention to trap Jesus. We know that he didn't just come to say, hey, I want to do it and I want to do it well. Is there a way that I can do this thing called religion really, really well? Um, he came with the intention to trap him. And you know, incredibly, Jesus pointed them away from a statue. Thank you. Appreciate that. Excuse me. Jesus pointed them away from a statue and he centered the focus on wholehearted, all-pervading love relationship with God first and broadened it in a way that Pharisee probably didn't expect. Jesus' reply to the Pharisee was, God takes first place. Love him with everything, heart, soul, mind, and Luke the doctor adds strength. Well, he would because he's physically aware a doctor. And Jesus went on to explain to the Pharisee who was um, that the first commandment also had a second that was like it. I guess the first divine, buy one, get one free. Jesus said, I'll give you this. The first commandment and the greatest of them all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. And the second is just like the first. So Jesus' clear instruction to love God first. And according to, I looked up in Strong's uh, Greek concordance, and that word for love means agapeo. And it means to love properly, to prefer to love. For the believer, it says, preferring to live through Christ. Love for the believer, to love God for the believer. Get this, it means embracing God's will, choosing his choices and obeying them through his power. Agapeo, the love of God that we're meant to have as a believer, preeminently refers to what God prefers as he is love. So when I say that I love God, I'm really saying that I want to actively do what the Lord prefers and I want to do it by his power and at his direction. That's just not a warm, fuzzy feeling, isn't it? Because obviously it implies that because I love God, I'm going to prefer him and I'm going to want to do God's will. So it speaks to the broader issues of ministry and commission and service and behavior. It's not just a fuzzy feeling. And when Jesus said the second is like it, the second commandment is like it, that word means homoios. And it means of equal rank. So it's equally as important. The first thing that's really important as a believer is that we love God, that we prefer him, that we give him priority, that we choose his choosing. I really like that, that we choose his choosing and embrace his will and complete his mission by his power. So there's this, all these issues of dependence and reliance and relationship when we talk about loving God in order that we can go on to do what God wants us to do. When Jesus says love, he's not talking about some fuzzy emotion. He's talking about quantifiable action, about surrender of will, about conviction that limits our choices, about collaboration that has us partner with God to do what God wants to get it done his way. And so before we go on to anything else, church, I really, before we get to the great um, commission, I really want us to have this First, this initial, most important, preeminent, this priority of the greatest commandment under our belt. And the great commandment to love means that we have to be a people who choose and prefer God's will, that we want it done his way. And all of everything that we do needs to flow from a preferential love bias between God and ourselves. So you get the link. The impact of the second commandment, which was, the, which was to love your neighbor 
as yourself, works in us because we've got the first one preferring God's will, making, choosing his choices, embracing what he wants. So it becomes really easy then to see that if we're going to be effective in the Great Commission, we have to first get grounded in the greatest commandment. Jesus' life was manifested. It manifested itself in love for God and God, love for God that was poured out in love for others. Listen to this from the Benson Commentary. It says, For the love of God will make us humble and contented in our lot. It will preserve us from all intemperance and patience and unholy desires. It will make us watchful over ourselves that we may keep a good conscience and solicitous for our eternal welfare. And the love of our neighbour will free us from all angry passions, envy, malice, revenge, and other unkind tempers, so that both taken together will introduce into us the whole mind that was in Christ and cause us to walk as he walked. I long for a church that chooses what God chooses. I long for a church that will walk as he walked. And I think it is entirely based in this agapeo love where individuals coming together collectively have chosen to choose what God wants, to prefer what God wants, to embrace his will above our own, to do the job that he's called us to in the power of Holy Spirit who has come to us for that very purpose. You know, looking over Jesus' life, he didn't moralize. He didn't marginalize. He didn't proselytize. And he didn't criticize. He walked daily in authentic and devoted relationship with his heavenly Father. And from that position of loving communion, he was able to live, love, and complete the mission he was sent to do. Brennan Manning says, the habit of moralizing spoils religion. When we get to grips with the fact that Jesus sees, knows, and embraces us, what's and all, we love him the more, and the more love, the better able we are to hear his will for our life, to fulfill the destiny on our life, and to joyously reflect God's love for others. Isn't that the message of the gospel? Isn't that the Great Commission? Frank Turek says that the best definition of evangelism he's ever heard is evangelism is one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. I love that. Evangelism is one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. Do you know, if that's the Great Commission, that I recognize that I was starving until the manna from heaven came and nourished me into life, until God fed me from a banqueting table of everything that I would need for every situation. And all I'm doing when I evangelize is letting another hungry soul know, hey, I know where the banqueting table is. And I know the one who has set it. And I know that he never turns anybody away. And I know that he set the table with delicious life necessities that he knows that you need and he wants you to get them. If that's the Great Commission, I can get on board with that because I understand what a beggar I have been. I understand how well I've been nourished. You know, obviously, we don't need to moralise, spiritualise, marginalise, proselytise or criticise as we sally forth into the Great Commission. No, having eaten of the bread of life, having been soul, body and spirit nourished by Jesus, our manna from heaven, our bread of life, How can we keep this bounty of grace and goodness to ourselves? I've come to realise that love experienced ignites zeal. That's why I say to you, get the first, the greatest commandment right, and then the great commission will follow really easily. If we learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that means with all of my thinking, with all of my choosing, with all of my ability, I choose the choosing of God for my life. I prefer what God has for me than what I could give myself or anybody else could. That's the first paradox. The church of Jesus Christ looks up in order to look out. We look up to find God's love fairly focused on us and we respond to that and out of that we sally forth into the Great Commission. The church of Jesus Christ, here's another paradox. It exists for others and not for itself. I mean, who would have a business where every bit of gain was for someone else and not for yourself? Yet the church is the only thing that exists for itself and not for others. Listen to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. 
an incredible, an incredible German theologian, very instrumental speaking out about anti-Nazism, and it cost him his life during the Second World War. He died in a concentration camp, but not before he'd written books that actually have become classics uh, in Christian literature. And Bonhoeffer said this, the church is the church only when it exists for others, not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell men of every calling what it means to live for Christ, to exist for others. Really important. If we think of the church as my little place where I come to get cozied up and to get comforted, we think of the church as a hospital, we think of the church as a social club. Listen, the church exists for others. And we need to be so convinced of this that actually church for us doesn't become a place where we come with an attitude of, well, what do you got for me today? You didn't please me today. It didn't please me to bother myself to get out of bed and come to church. Well, you know, I could have stayed home if that's all I've got. If we get that attitude, we've missed it as a church. The church is the church only when it exists for others, not dominating but helping and serving. It must tell men of every calling what it means to live for Christ, to exist for others. You know, some people might think of the church in this way. Some people might think that the church is a funnel. You get different sizes of them. Some are big, some are small. And the church, some people, you might, you might think of church this way, that the church is a funnel and here are all the Christians and we're in here and we get poured out upon the world. I'm going to do New Zealand down here because it gets forgotten. Everything else, got nobody else on here but New Zealand. Um, and so Christians go in at the top of the funnel. This is what church is, maybe to some people. Church, Christians, like a funnel, and God sends us out and pours us into the world. Well, that's inadequate for me. I can't think of church like that. It's far too objectified for me. I don't like to think of the church as a thing that sends other things into the world to do an important thing that's really important to the things who are going. I can't think of church as a thing. It's too alive for me. It's living. So it doesn't, that doesn't work for me. And lockdown is redefining so much that church is centre stage under that microscope as gathering corporately to worship in our own unique style is still a no-go, which means that we need to get to grips with our definition of church, which is why I've provoked you by thinking, is that what you think about church? That church is like a funnel, we all come in and then we all go out? Into this, hold that thought, because I'm going to come back to it, but if being unable to attend a church service causes our faith and Christian commitment to waver or wane, we certainly need to redefine what church is. Because I don't believe that the world and people who don't yet know Jesus need a church service. I don't believe they do. I believe that they need a genuine encounter with someone who's had a life transforming encounter with Jesus Christ on the grounds of their own heart that has so radically transformed them and convinced them and persuaded and turned them around to fully prefer, to fully love the Lord, to fully choose his choosing and embrace his will and reflect his character. I think that's what the world needs and that's what church is to me. I've settled it for myself that church is not a building, a denomination, an institution or an event. I've settled it for myself that it's not a sheltering outpost of the remnant faithful trying to bear up under the relentless pressure of hell's gates. I've settled it that church is not geographically based, though it can be found in almost every location on earth. And I've settled it that it's not an organisation, though I recognise as a senior leader that you need good organisation within your churches for them to function well. These are some of the paradoxes of trying to uh, put a one-size-fits-all definition over the church. Furthermore, scripture is really clear that the church, people of God who make up the church, we're in the world, yet not of the world. 
meaning that although churches are spread across the globe, yet church does not take its power, its identity, or its purpose from the secular. And if that is not paradoxical enough, church is clearly sent into the same world that does not want it, that is at odds with its necessity, relevance, and value. The church is in the world, but not of the world, in order that it might go into the world and be the catalyst for Christ-reflecting kingdom culture, wherever it is received. I want to say that again. The church is in the world, but it's not of the world, in order that it might go into the world and be a catalyst for Christ-reflecting culture. The church is in the world. It's not in a funnel. It is in the world. It is seeding the world with the incorruptible seed and the light of Jesus Christ. That's what it's doing. Being a catalyst for Christ-reflecting kingdom culture wherever it is received. I believe that the best examples of, of church being the church will be multicultural, yet take their identity not from ethnicity but from Christ. According to the Apostle Paul, to be baptised into Christ, and this is Galatians 3.28, he maintains that once you're baptised into Christ, the playing field is very levelled. He says, if you are baptised into Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. The church of Jesus Christ that love God, loves God and chooses his choosing and embraces his will and wants to get his work done his way has cultural diversity, has no caste or class system, and is not gender-centric. It runs revolutionary to so many other organisations that are out there. And the church is not an organisation, but it's a, it's a word that I can offer you when you want to make a comparison. The church, I believe, that truly reflects God is populated by grateful and glad hearts who have first-hand experienced forgiveness and who now pay that forgiveness forward. Last week, Tim said that forgiveness should be our default. Forgiveness should be our default. And along those lines, if forgiveness is our default, then repentance should be our second nature. The former keeps us grateful, and the latter keeps us humble. Forgiveness keeps us grateful that the mercy of God has come into our life and accepted and approved us and that the power of Christ has broken the dominion of sin in our life. And the latter, repentance keeps me humble, keeps me from moralizing, of pointing the finger, of actually being super spiritual and pious and self-righteous as I get about the commission because I understand I'm a hair's breadth away I'm a hair's breadth away from sin myself. I also believe that the church, here's another paradox, is populated by people dead to themselves but fully alive in and through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 tells us that we were dead in our trespass and sins, speaking of a time before we had come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ that we, tells us that we conform to the ways of the, this world, that we're under the rulership of the power of darkness, of the devil. That we lived at one time, I was so dead that all I did was let my appetites fuel my desires and my thoughts. And as such, I was destined for the wrath of God. And it reminds us that it was God who was rich in mercy and whose incredibly great love came to us in the face of Jesus Christ, that we have been made alive with Christ and who raised us up from the dead. It's a beautiful passage. And so now the church is populated by people dead to themselves but fully alive and th in and through Jesus Christ. To put it bluntly, to live outside of Christ is to live outside of life. That's why it's so important, this message of the Great Commission, how we present it to people. Because who, who wants those that we love to live outside of life? And we know that Ephesians is talking about being spiritually dead, obviously, without wishing to be offensive in comparison to the fully alive body of Christ, the world is populated by zombies, the walking dead. And it's only when we come to Christ that we're made alive. 
And I, I kind of see the church as this. There's a story about um, Elijah, and he goes in a, a widow, build, um, she builds a room, and he comes to visit, and her son dies. Elijah or Elisha, Tig? Uh, Elisha. Elisha. And she has the prophet, she invites him in, and he lays himself, his own body, on the body of the dead child, and the child comes back to life, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the church is. I think the church is a body so alive with the life of Christ that when that body of Christ impacts those who are dead and trespass and sin, you know what happens? Resurrection happens. That's why we talk about being born again, that the experience is as radical, the transforming experience of the new birth is as radical as moving from death to life. To have that body of Christ, that body infused with the life and the virility and the power of Jesus Christ, working through the church, coming into contact with those who are dead and trespass and sin, This fusion of spirit and life bringing resurrection. That's why my favorite analogy of the church is that we are Christ's body. And as with all bodies, the body serves the head. Ergo, Jesus, the head of his body, Christ's body serves Christ's purpose. Colossians 1.18 says that Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all, who rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. And I was just having doing a little bit of reading about the Roman culture in Jesus' day, and I, I didn't understand that actually Romans elevated appetite to king. They regarded, actually, there was a, 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 a thought that actually if you had an appetite or a desire, you just had to indulge that because you were actually quite powerless against your appetites. And according to your caste system, how high-born you were, how high-brow you were in society, you could indulge those appetites as much as your social standing allowed. In fact, for a man to indulge his um, appetites, especially sexually, showed his vir, V-I-R, or his virility. And so the Romans considered that appetites were king and they had to be obeyed. Now, we know that you only have appetites that, because you've got a body. Now, I want you to hold that against this thought. Christianity blazoned a message of self-control into the sexually permissive cultural backdrop. God came saying to his people, hey, I've called you holy. I don't want you indulging. I don't want you to be at the mercy of your appetites. I don't want you to have a body of flesh that leads you astray into things. I'm giving you, there's a new parameter. There's a new framework. There's a new body. It's my body. And in my body, which is governed by Jesus as the head and which is empowered by Holy Spirit, there's new fruit. One of those is called self-control. that left to ourselves, the appetites of our body, they're carnal, and our fleshly nature will want to take us one way, but we need to have a wise head to help us curb the flesh. That needs to happen in the body of Christ too, because left to ourselves, listen, we've done a lot of damage. I think think the church has hurt people. Religion has hurt people, but I don't believe that's what the church of Jesus Christ was ever meant to do. That's why unless we take our lead from Jesus, who's the head of the church, which is his body, congregations stray into legalism, rationalism, humanism, intellectualism, racism, classism, judgmentalism, any other ism. That's why it's really important that as the church and the body of Christ being the church and the church being the body of Christ, that we are taking our lead being informed by Jesus, our head. Instead of the picture of the church as a funnel, I see, and the world as a place, I see the church as the body of Christ, a body that is fully vibrant, undefeatably alive, and fully Holy Spirit, reliant, instructed, and empowered. I believe that the church as the body of Christ reproduces microcosms of healing and service that are designed to reflect God's love and nature into their respective spheres of influence. A guy called Greg R. Allison, he has a PhD and theologian, Um, 
and identifying seven key markers about the church post-Reformation. He said, the first one he said was that the church is doxological, it's oriented toward the glory of God. And I ask us this morning, where can this glory be more powerfully evident than in a church that has God's commandment fueling Christ's commission and shaping kingdom culture? Recently, I worked through Brennan Manning's book, A Glimpse of Jesus, Stranger to Self-Hatred, and one chapter made a huge impression on me as a church leader. It was chapter three called Healing Through Meal Sharing, and Manning made an many beautiful statements about Jesus. Here's a few. He said that Jesus meant to befriend the rabble, that by accepting them as friends and equals, Jesus took away their shame, humiliation, and guilt, that Jesus never dreamed of disallowing or rejecting, that through sharing meals, Jesus was extending God's approval and acceptance of others. And bear in mind what I said earlier, that the church as Christ's body is in the world in order to impact the world in which it is situated. What could that look like? How about a church that is characterized by befriending, by acceptance, equality, dignity, non-judgmentalism, no moralizing, inclusion, the message of God's approval, his unconditional come-as-you-are love, his no-strings-attached offer of hope, and his ever-present willingness to heal. That's the Great Commission. A church like that's unstoppable. If we're fully convinced that we are in Christ in order to move into sharing him with others, please, church, please, let's take a leaf out of Jesus' book. I agree with Brennan Manning that church should be a home for all, saint and sinner alike, where the healing community of Jesus Christ trumpets out God's indiscriminate love. I'm going to quote from a guy called um, Hans Kung. A church that will not accept the fact that it consists of sinful men and exists for sinful men becomes hard-hearted, self-righteous, and inhuman. It deserves neither God's mercy nor men's trust. But if a church with a history of fidelity and infidelity, of knowledge and error, takes seriously the fact that it is only in God's kingdom that the wheat is separated from the tares, good fish from bad, sheep from goats, a holiness will be acknowledged in it by grace which it cannot create for itself. Such a church is then aware that it has no need to present a spectacle of higher morality to society as if everything in it were ordered to the best. It is aware that its faith is weak, its knowledge dim, its profession of faith halting that there is not a single sin or failing which it has not in one way or another been guilty of. And though it is true that the church must always disassociate itself from sin, it can never have any excuse for keeping any sinners at a distance. If the church self-righteously remains aloof from failures, irreligious and immoral people, it cannot enter justified into God's kingdom. But if it is constantly aware of its guilt and sin, it can live in joyous awareness of forgiveness. The promise has been given to it that anyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Listen, before we rush out to take the world by storm, we need to recognize the church can't save anybody. Jesus alone saves The church is called to reflect and represent him in such a way that we do not repel people from coming to Jesus, the one who saves. So I want you to consider this this morning. Does the message you model diminish your value? Church, the church is made up of people. The people make up the church, which is the body of Jesus Christ. Ask yourself, do I model Does the Christianity I model diminish in value? Do I add to the burdens of others or do I stop to help them carry the load? Does my theology force people into hiding, separation and loneliness? Because we need to get a clue about the Great Commission because without the impetus and framework of the greatest commandment, we run the risk of becoming pious, self-righteous and smug. And I secretly hope that the church of Jesus Christ will one day be defined as people in fellowship with God, taking other people into fellowship with God. And in this way, collectively, the church, bracket the body of Christ, will reflect that God is in our midst. There's so much more about the church that I could say this morning, but time I've gone on for long enough. 
Let me just say that the church is here, but it is yet to be fully established. It's already here, but not yet. We're sojourners, we're strangers. I'm, I'm quoting Alison. And remind us that we're, something, we're part of something that's so big so much bigger than any earthly expression we have yet seen or encountered. But we are invited by God himself to take our place in his body and reflect his glory. The glory of the church that bears his name is reflected as people who have chosen to love God and embrace, choose his choosing and embrace his will and do his work in the power of the Holy Spirit. People who have eaten of the bread of heaven and who are generous to give that access away to others. When that happens, the fulfillment of the Great Commission will be natural and it will be beautifully fueled and rightly biased because people who love God, people who really love God and choose his choosing, know that God chooses people because they're the only things that last forever. You know, I've bet the farm on mission. I am so for mission. I am not mission averse and I'm not saying, church, we can't do. I, I understand we must do the mission. But I just don't want religious, a religious heart. I want a living, vibrant mission dance that flows out of the Great Commission. Right motivation and purposeful mission, I believe, is going to bring tangible manifestation of Jesus Christ in our midst. And church, if you are there this morning, I just want to say, make a fresh commitment to love God, to choose his choosing. And maybe you're tuned in and you have never yet made a decision decision to love God. Because that's what he asks. I'll just tell you, the short version of the gospel version is that really God was unprepared to do eternity without you. So knowing that you couldn't get to him by yourself, he sent Jesus who was the human bridge to God. The nutshell is that God loves each one of us so much, irrespective of what we've done, that he longs to spend eternity with us and to lay his own fully vibrant, life-filled self upon us and raise us up out of our dead men walking, zombie existence into a life that is beyond anything that we could ever, ever hope to experience. The way you do that, and I'll just invite you, you know, if you might say to yourself, actually, Bowie, I think I'm ready. I want that. I want to know God genuinely, truly. Then this is the type of prayer that you would pray, and you can pray it with me out loud where you are or pray it in your heart because God hears our sincere prayers. Just something like this. Oh, oh God, I come to you on the basis of who Jesus is. I believe that Jesus died for me. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I can't get to you any other way except through Jesus. But I know that I need you and I want you now. I want, I want you to be tangibly evident in my life. I want to know you. I want to know the destiny that you have for me and I'm going to ask you now to forgive my sin. I confess that I have sinned but I believe that Jesus went to Calvary for me. Please forgive me. Please cleanse me. Please set my feet on that right path, that that road that leads to you. I need you, Jesus, to do life, and I'm asking you to come do life with me, to invite me into your life and show me what real life is, to heal my life and heal my heart. I tell you what, if you pray a prayer like that, or words like it, those sentiments, they have power because you are asking God. God is so responsive to a repentant heart. And if you've prayed that, there should de- you should definitely feel an uprising of joy in your heart because to be forgiven from our sins is something that's so real. You can't make it up, I'll tell you. You ask anybody who, who has experienced God and his saving grace, you don't make this stuff up. It's very, very real. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to support you in that decision. I want to just say thank you yet again for joining in to Lee Valley Church this morning. It's been wonderful to be with you this morning. Thank you so much. Amen. What a great word. And you know, as we are, whatever we're doing over the next few days, let's just have it in our mind. We are in the world. Our lives are changed. We've encountered Jesus. 
and we are in the world. This isn't a funnel. We are the church in the world, and uh, I just hope, and uh, uh, my heart is, if, we, if you prayed that prayer with uh, Bo, we'd really love to hear from you, you know, and we'd really love if you could just email us or message us. I just know that, you know, people's lives will be changed, and uh, we want... We want to follow you up. We want to be able to celebrate that somebody has given their life to Jesus. So please don't be afraid. Please reach out to us. So right now we're going to do communion. And uh, please make sure you've got your wine and bread or your juice and your cracker, whatever you've got. And we're going to take that together now. And then at 11.15, join us for, on Facebook Live for our kids' service. Thank you so much. Thank you, worship team, which is Bo and... Hayes, and thank you, Jeff, for being behind the camera, and of course, thank you both for your message. And God bless you. We'll see you next week. So cool. So communion. You know, there are many things in our Christian life and in our expression of our Christianity that uh, are essentials of what we are, who we are, what we believe in, various things that we do. You know, there's those things like, uh, you know, salvation, obviously. There is water baptism, baptizing the Holy Spirit. There is communion. But you know what? It, and it all, uh, those are all good and wonderful, but it all has to center around Christ. And this is what is so cool about communion, because communion centers around Christ. It's all about Christ. We are remembering what he did. And uh, as he spoke to his disciples and he told them, do this and remember, in remembrance of me, take this bread bit of bread and eat it in remembrance of my body that was broken for you take this uh, bit of wine and drink it in remembrance of my blood that was shed on the cross so as we come to communion we we need to we do it because it become because we are remembering the very central part of our christian life jesus christ yeah Jesus Christ being the center of everything, being the center of who we are, what we are. Because without Christ, we wouldn't be Christians. It's as simple as that. Without Christ, we wouldn't have a faith to believe in. We wouldn't have an expectation of a, of a heaven that we would go to. We wouldn't have a, uh, you know, the, the whole deal just simply wouldn't be what it is. So as you take your bit of bread, is something, anything you want to say? That's great. So as you take your bit of bread, your cracker, we've got our matzo cracker here, and um, we remember his body that was broken. It's central part of this whole deal, his body that was broken for you and I, for each one of us. So, Jesus, we thank you. Yes, we do. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your thank you, willing Jesus. to go through it all, the cruelty of the cross, the absolute revolting thing that the cross, that the Roman cross was, and how it punished people, how it was, there was, there was nothing nice about it. Mm, torturous. Absolutely torturous, mm. ugly, horrible thing, horrible thing. And then as we take our wine or juice or whatever you're drinking this morning, because it really doesn't matter, because remember, it's symbolic. It isn't the actual blood of Jesus. It mm. doesn't turn into anything. And, you know, we happen to have some red wine with us. So um, here we go, sweetie. What's locked down without a little wine? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you for your cleansing. Thank you for the freedom and the life and the liberty that flows because, Jesus, your blood was shed for us. Yeah, Jesus, thank you for your blood. I can remember when we used to be involved, used to be involved in a, um, a ministry called Quest, and uh, when the men used to gather together and we'd have uh, communion, we used to stand up, and we'd all stand up and go, cheers to you, mighty king, and uh, it was such a good thing, because he is our mighty king, he is our great saviour, so God yeah. bless you, don't give up, keep pressing on, he's on your side, he's not against you, God bless you, and Amen. we'll catch up with you soon, God bless. Amen. Thanks, man. Cool.